people, welcome back folks. I am taking advantage of this two hour delay situation today to make a couple videos for you guys and get you guys wrapped up with unit number four. So today our focus is going to be on acid base and redox reactions. Hopefully something you know a little bit about. We'll probably dive into the material a little bit deeper than what you have done previously, but I know I'm excited. The quick unit, get it done, get it out of the way, and we move on to our next one. So let's get started. So hopefully by the end of this video, you will be able to explain the differences between different types of chemical reactions. You should be able to identify reactions of acids and bases and determine which are strong and weak. You should be able to identify acid conjugate acid pairs and base conjugate base pairs. You should be able to identify redox reactions, determine what is oxidized and what is reduced in a reaction, as well as to be able to write half reactions and balance chemical equations from them. So let's start off with some basics about acid-base reactions. Now, there's lots of different definitions for acid-base reactions, but for this particular class, we're going to focus on what's called the Bronsted-Lowry rules. And the Bronsted-Lowry rules state that they involve a donation of a proton, which would be an acid, to another species, which is a base that accepts it. So a couple examples given below, we have sodium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid. Pretty straightforward here. The HCl is going to donate a hydrogen, and the OH is going to accept the hydrogen. Remember that these are all aqueous when we put them into solution. And so as a result, we form water from that. The HCl is the acid, the NOH is the base. Okay. So if you see below, we have our net ionic equation. Again, with our net ionic equation, we only look at species that change based on the chemical reaction that is given. So in this case, OH and H combined to form a liquid, which is water. All of the other ions are considered spectator ions. Now, acids and bases are not quite as cut and dry as what maybe they used to be. So you need to look very closely at what donates a proton and what accepts a proton. So we look here, we have HCl, but we have NH3. Now, typically, we think of bases as something that has a hydroxide on the end of it. And that's not always necessarily the case. In this instance, NH3 acts as our base because it accepts the proton from HCl. Thus, HCl is our acid and NH3 is our base. Now, we'll talk about conjugate acid, conjugate bases a little bit later on in the video. Now, water's role is really important here because water is considered amphoteric, meaning that it can behave as an acid or a base depending upon what it is reacting with. So, for example, HCl and water, well, if we do that, we end up with actually H3O+. Plus. So, our net ionic equation would be H plus plus H2O yields H3O+. Plus. Cl acts as a spectator ion, so thus H2O acts as a base because it accepts that hydrogen. Now, if we mix H2O with a base, interestingly enough, the H2O actually donates a hydrogen, thus becoming an acid. So you need to really think about what are the net ionic equations that are present here? What is actually going on when you go through and conduct these experiments? So it's helpful to think about what's a liquid and what is aqueous, what actually breaks down versus what doesn't break down, and that should help you figure out exactly what's going on and what these net ionic equations would be. Now, something that's really important, especially when we're looking at net ionic equations of this, would be to look at whether you're looking at a strong acid or base or a weak acid or base. Now, your strong acids or bases completely dissociate when you place them into solution. They break apart fully into their ions. So think of them almost like an ionic substance. Ionic substances completely dissociate into their positive and negative ions. And strong acids and bases are going to do the exact same thing. We have six strong acids, HCl, HBr, HI, HNO3, H2SO4, and HClO4. Very important to make sure that you memorize those. Weak acids and bases only partially dissociate. So when they're formed from other aqueous solutions, they'll be a part of the net ionic equation since most of the material will not be dissolved into the solution. So if we take a look here, we have NH3 and HCl. Now, NH3 accepts the hydrogen from HCl, thus becoming NH4. So as a result, that is actually a part of our net ionic equation because it is something that has changes. Even though that it is still aqueous in solution, it does not um, it still changes as a result. Chlorine is the only thing that does not change here. So if we take a look at our net ionic equation here, we have NH3, which is aqueous, combined with H, which is aqueous. Cl is also aqueous, but remember, that's a spectator ion. And that combines to form NH4+. Plus. That is your net ionic equation there. So be a little bit careful, because sometimes aqueous things do appear in your net ionic equation. You just need to make sure that you're aware of that. 
So your acid and your base are always your reactants in an acid-base reaction. There's other terms that we use to describe our products. The conjugate base is the species which has donated the proton in your products. So thus the acid becomes the conjugate base. So if we look at the bottom here, our conjugate pair, we have HCl, which is our acid. Cl minus then is our conjugate base because it has donated the proton. Okay, the proton is missing from it, therefore it is a base. The conjugate acid is the species which has accepted the proton and uh, in your products, and thus the base becomes the conjugate acid. You have NH3 here. NH3 accepts the hydrogen, or accepts the proton from HCl, becomes NH4+, and therefore becomes the conjugate acid. So it is a bit tricky, because your acid becomes your conjugate base, and your base becomes your conjugate acid. Again, a couple key vocab terms we really need to make sure that we know. The last thing I want to talk about in this video are redox reactions. Now, redox reactions involve the transfer of one or more electrons between chemical species as indicated by the change in the oxidation number of that particular species. So if we take a look at the examples down below, let's look at the one on the left here. Mn is a plus 4. When it reacts with aluminum, it ends up becoming a zero charge. So if we think about it, did that gain electrons or lose electrons? Well, because it went from a plus 4 to a 0, and electrons are negatively charged, it gained 4 electrons in that process. Therefore, we say that manganese has been reduced. Aluminum, on the other hand, goes from 0 to a plus 3. It is losing negatives. It is losing negative charges. So as a result, we say it is being oxidized. Very common reactions include combustion reactions and single displacement reactions. Those are common redox reactions. And even if we look at things that you wouldn't think normally would have charges, so for example, if we look at a combustion reaction which deals with things that are just purely covalent, uh, they still have oxidation numbers. We just have to remember that hydrogens are plus ones, O's are almost always minus twos unless they're bonded, uh, unless they're not bonded with anything. Um, and as you can look here, your carbon atom is actually reduced. It goes from a minus four to a plus four, and oxygen goes from a zero to a minus two. You'll see how this works here in just a moment. So these are your rules, and your rules are actually very similar to how we look at charges. The only difference is that we have to sometimes finagle things that we don't necessarily know. So we always want to look at things that we absolutely know for sure have certain oxidation numbers. So for example, elements by themselves are zero. Atomic ions are always the charge, group one, group two, hydrogens, um, oxygens, fluorine. So remember that when we look at these, very similar to how we determine the charge on type twos, that the sum of all the oxidation numbers of a neutral compound is zero, or if it is a uh, polyatomic ion, it is the charge. So again, they're very similar to determining charges in ions. The only change is that you use this to determine oxidation numbers in covalently bonded substances as well as ionic. Let's do maybe one or two practice problems just to make sure we've got a good hang on this. All right, so I'm not going to look at all of these, but I do want to look at a couple of these just to get you guys the idea of how this looks. I'm actually going to start off with number seven because it's probably the one that you're most familiar with here. So what we need to look at is to determine if something either gains or loses electrons in the process here. So here we have Na+, plus, okay, and Na+, plus, so there's no change there, Cl-, minus, and Cl and AgCl is also going to be Cl-, minus, right, because Ag is a plus one, Cl is a minus one. Ag here positive, NO3 positive, so there is no redox, okay? So there's nothing going on here. Let's take a look at the bottom one here. We have 2HBr plus Cl minus, I'm sorry, Cl2 yields 2HCl and 2Br. Well, anything by itself has an oxidation number of zero, so we're good there. Hydrogens are always plus one. Bromine here, give me a minus one. Chlorine here is also going to be a minus one. So you can see there's actually some change that's here. So what we need to do is look at what has changed. Chlorine goes from a zero to a negative one. So you have to ask yourself, did that gain electrons or did that lose electrons? Well, in this case, it goes from a zero to a plus one, so it gains electrons. Remember our Leo Ger, gaining electrons is reduction. So this is being reduced. Our bromine goes from a minus one to a zero. That loses electrons. So that is being oxidized. Now when we talk about half reactions, all we're going to do here is we're going to look at what is given and then write our half reactions. Now half reactions do include electrons. So for example here, we have Cl2 
becoming 2Cl minus. So you have to think about it. That gained electrons. Where did that gain electrons from? Well, it gained it from our reactants, right? So in order to balance this, we're going to add two electrons for the first part. Okay? And if we look at the second one, we go from 2Br to Br2. And it lost electrons. So those electrons are going to be lost on this side. You go and write your half reactions that are associated with this. Okay? So we can just take it one step at a time, look at what's being oxidized, what's being reduced, and you guys should be just fine. Real quick, let's just take a look at the top one here. O is always a minus 2. Okay? So this is minus 4. So S here is a positive 4. Okay? Um, H's are plus 1. O is a minus 2. That balances out just fine. Here, plus 1 for each H. So we have plus 2. O's are minus 2, so we have minus 6. So if you think about it, all this has to balance out. So S here is going to be a plus 4. So again, no changes here. Everything looks good. So there is no redox in this equation up at the top. Okay. So again, just look at your charges, figure out where we're going, and um, you guys will be just fine. So again, just a reminder, half reactions show the oxidation and reduction of a species by also including the number of electrons either gained or lost by the element. Again, it is important to know the difference between reduction and oxidation. When we oxidize something, we are losing electrons. So if you look at the oxidation half reaction, we have those electrons, and then they go away in the product section. When we reduce something, we are gaining electrons, right? Gaining is reduction. Gaining electrons reduction. So as a result, they're part of the reactants part. So again, assign oxidation numbers, figure out what those half reactions look like, and know the difference between reduction and oxidation. Now, sometimes it's going to ask you to actually determine the entire ionic equation based off of the half reactions. And so you work it kind of like a math problem to first balance out your electrons. So in this example here, we have two electrons on the left-hand side and one on the right-hand side. Well, to balance that out, we need to multiply the second part there by two. And then you just kind of cancel out the electrons and combine the equations together. Now, make sure you double check to make sure everything, including your atoms, balances out as you go through and complete this. There's some other things that we can do with half reactions and balancing equations, but not necessary here. So we're good to go. Hey, hope you guys got a lot out of the video. Uh, pretty straightforward stuff today. Make sure you differentiate between all the stuff we've talked about with acids and bases and redox reactions. We'll see you guys next time. Have a great day, guys, and we will talk to you later. This is Jayland Bio signing out. Make sure you like, subscribe, leave a comment down below, and shop merch.